So we're doing these weekly and we're talking to various uh, crypto companies in the space about you know their projects, about how they grew their team, their working culture, and tips about how to join crypto full-time or even part-time. The format is pretty much we're going to be talking for about 40 minutes. And then in the end of that, we're going to leave about maybe 20 minutes or so, maybe longer, to Q&A from the community. Start writing down the questions and uh, we'll be able to answer them uh, towards the end. Hi, really Stefan. Good. How are you doing? Hey, doing good. Thank you. Really excited to be here. And, and thanks for inviting me and hosting this event. So excited. Awesome. Thanks awesome. for saying yes. Yeah. <laughs> so excited, excited <laughs> to have you. Uh, a true crypto veteran today with us. All right, uh, Stefan, I'll just let you introduce yourself and trust, Trusted Node and uh, all the projects that you're currently working on. And then we'll kind of go through a few questions that I have planned for today. Great, great. No, thank you again. And um, nice to meet everyone here. Look, I've been in Bitcoin since 2012, got in really early. I've spent most of my career um, in technology, um, luckily experiencing the internet and the growth thereof, and then mobile. And out of that, my whole function has always been working with developers and building developer ecosystems. And it was in 2012 when I was working with some of the largest technology companies in the world. And this one in specifically with Sony Ericsson, when we were doing a worldwide roadshow for their Android phones to acquire developers to build applications unique to their mobile phones. When one of the developers asked if they could get paid in Bitcoin, and this was 2012, really early on. And yeah, that's how I got into Bitcoin. I was hooked right away. I paid them using a Skype call at the time. Um, and it was instant and it was, I mean, pretty much free. It cost me nothing. So it was, yeah, just, I got hooked from then on in. And when Ethereum came around, whilst I struggled with the unlimited supply, I really got excited by the smart contract capability and really dug into that once I realized that opportunity and just love the innovation and the velocity and speed at which innovation is happening across crypto land. Um, but, you know, crypto has gone through a number of different waves, ups and downs. And, you know, right now we had from 2017, literally, or 2018 through to 2021, we had a pretty tough time in crypto land. And it was really a way to sort of really find the, the hardened and true believers in this ecosystem and it really bonded a lot of us together to really pursue the grand vision of what of building this new decentraland right what does this um you know new land look like crypto land what does this look like how do we structure this and how do we build this and that's what really gets me excited in this environment right how do we build a decentralized governed environment um, that rewards all of the participants. And there are a number of themes and, 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 and philosophies that we've put down into black and white. And the company behind Trusted Node, which is sort of the company that we just listed yesterday on PancakeSwap, is um, sort of building, the building company, or is it really called Hydro Labs? Um, Hydro Labs is the legal entity, if you will. But how do we build new architectures, new companies that are all non-custodial, are governed in with smart contracts, are and reside and and manage the community through um, you know sort of DAOs? How do we build that out? How do we scale that? And that's really sort of the core philosophy behind Hydro Lab and Ultimate Trusted Node. And yeah, that's sort of where we're at. Awesome. Thanks for the, thanks for the brief intro. Yeah. I, there's definitely much more going on in your background, which yeah. we'll uh, uncover <laughs> in the next hour. Um, cool. So like, can you maybe summarize, ver like maybe in an elevator pitch, uh, the kind of what Trusted Node is working on and uh, how you're achieving that? So Trusted, we've seen growth of proof of stake blockchain networks. In, you know, there are about 30 layer one proof of stake blockchain networks in sort of the CoinGecko sort of top 100 by market cap uh, listings. 
across those networks. Um, and there are going to be a lot more coming out the road with, with the Cosmos chain and the Polkadot chain. But what we've seen is in order to secure those networks and secure the decentralization net nature of blockchain, there is a reward for participants that are providing security to those networks. We want to make it easy for anybody to participate in securing the networks and receiving the rewards for those. And that was the basic principle behind it. Um, we then added a twist to that where we are going, we're building out liquid staking capability, which allows users to keep their base capital earning the reward while at the same time, we give them a synthetic liquid token associated with their base capital to then be able to offer them um, participation in various DeFi services uh, in our network, but also on other networks. Uh, that's super yeah. cool. Which yeah. chains are you uh, planning to launch on? So at the moment, we're, we're supporting the, a lot of the Cosmos chains. Um, so we've got Sentinel, we've got Atom or Cosmos themselves, um, we've got uh, a Sent uh, a DVPN, um, we've got um, Persistence, we've got a Terra, and we're adding on to those um, the Polkadot ecosystem and then selected new chains um, that and layer ones as well. So we've been looking at and layer two, sorry. So we've been looking at Matic, we're looking at Velas as a Solana fork together with um, EVM compatibility on there. Uh, we've obviously talking about the you know the more famous ones or the the layer ones that we all know, Avalanche and um, yeah, and um, who else have we been talking to? A number of the other big ones, but we have not supported Ethereum too. Oh, why is that, by the way? Just that's curious. A, yeah, that's a good question. Mainly because each node is, supports 32 Ethereum. You need 32 Ethereum for each node, and then you just need to add more nodes onto that. And we just have decided to invest our resources in creating liquid staking versus creating fractionalized solutions for a ETH node of 32 ETH. Yeah, I believe there are quite a lot of that space is already pretty crowded. Uh, exactly. There's a lot of players in that space. Exactly. Like Lighter Finance and... Uh, Rocket Pool, you've got Anchor, you've got a number of them already providing non-custodial mm -hmm. services like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as I understand, you, you've been kind of starting uh, Trusted Node earlier this year, right? Yep. Did the idea come like overnight yeah. or was that a slow brewing process over several months or weeks? Um, how, what was the inception of the idea for those who are aspiring entrepreneurs or founders in, in this room? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of ideas and, and uh, as an entrepreneur, a lot of ideas are coming from problems that you experience. And having been in crypto since 2012, I've naturally sort of accumulated a multiple different portfolio of coins, if you will, or tokens. And I had them on exchanges, I had them on ledgers, I had them in, 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 uh, you know, in various wallets. And one of the things that I found is if they were in wallets, if they were in my, in my cold wallet on the ledger or in, in an exchange, that I wasn't earning any rewards. And coming from the proof of work mining area, I just felt I deserve rewards and I reserve the airdrops. And so... I was really upset at a couple of exchanges that weren't passing on, number one, the rewards, because they're using our capital on their exchanges to delegate and stake towards nodes that they're hosting either way. And they're just doing good cash management to then do the disbursement to their users when they called on. And so they weren't passing any of those rewards on to any of the their their customers or account holders, if you will, for lack of a better name. And the wallets, they're just sitting in your wallets, not earning anything. You do get the airdrops in the wallets, but you don't get the airdrops if they're on a centralized exchange. And so I just felt, man, and, and if you try and do it yourself, particularly in the earlier uh, blockchains, it's really cumbersome to get it set up. 
you know, you have to be a developer. You have to know how to use um, command line interfaces um, in order to set up a wallet, have a designated a wallet that receives the rewards, and you then need to maintain a node and ensure uptime and all of that so that you are receiving the rewards and minimize slashing. How do we make that easy? How can anybody participate in that? And everybody I talk to, we're really interested in getting the rewards from a blockchain on the one hand, and at the same time, also being able to collect and be reminded of all the airdrops, right? I don't know if you're on the Cosmos chain, Juno just did a download, an airdrop to all Atom stakers. So if you're securing the Cosmos blockchain and you have your Atom tokens in staked with a validator on the cosmos chain you received free ad uh, juno tokens one to one so for every atom you had staked you received an equivalent one and i think they're trading now ten dollars each so it could be a significant amount of funding that you would receive you know the other one that just came out today orion.money if you had your coins staked on a on the terra blockchain, your Lunas, you would have received Orion.money tokens. Uh, they weren't as valuable, but still, you received those rewards. How do you get notified of that opportunity, number one? And then number two is how do you get airdropped that reward? So you actually do receive it for the work that your stake is providing. And so that was sort of the genesis. I wanted to make sure users received that and were considered for their contributions to securing the network and not just held with these centralized exchanges. And it would be easy for people to participate in. I think this is a fantastic reminder about the importance of self-custody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of people, especially who are new to the space, they join the space through some sort of fiat on-ramp, through some sort of centralized exchange. That's where they keep majority of their, of their funds and they yeah. kind of trust those centralized exchanges. But they forget, they get it really, uh, they miss out on a lot of these airdrops and those airdrops can be a really significant amount of money. And um, especially in the earlier days when we when we experienced like chain splits or chain forks, yep, uh, exactly. for example, a lot, of people, a lot of people were able to get a significant amount of money by, you know, cashing out their BCH or BSV exactly. uh, just because they held uh, BTC from earlier days. And I think there are a lot of exchanges in the space that did not even, you know, give you back your, your you know, the BCH that you own or be uh, BSV. I mean, regardless of uh, the different opinions that on these uh, coins that people might have in this room. But uh, I personally know a lot of like BTC maxis. I'm not one myself, <laughs> but I know a few that uh, that are still very happy about their um, what they pretty much cashed out uh, and, you know, the, the, B, the BCH that they sold. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, no, and that's exactly a point, right? So at that fork, and that was really, to be honest, that was one of the genesis behind the concept behind Trusted Node was there was the fork BCH, BTC, BCH, right? So that happened. <laughs> and then there was this, you know, and, you know, BTC Maxis, whether they liked it or not, they got a nice bag of BCHs. They sold it at the peak, which was, I think, about $3,000 at the time. So they all made a significant amount of money from that fork. Um, and the ones that held on still have a whole bunch of bags. And the second fork, which was the BCH to BCHA fork that happened, um, I think it was last year. And and to me, that was the, the genesis of the idea, which was really some of the exchanges where I had my BCH on. Um, didn't pass that airdrop or that fork coin onto me. And that's when I really got frustrated and upset. And I think I did tweet a number of times as to which exchanges they were. And, but some of the exchanges were really good, fast, agile, and they took their the timestamps um, as to when, how much you owned, and then they gave you that airdrop. Yeah, I think it's an amazing um, motivation or uh, kind of inspiration for, uh, for a project. Yeah. When you run into a problem and then you need to solve it yourself, you don't see anyone else solving it. So, uh, you know, sooner or later, so someone's going to do it. So you might as well be you. So when you were starting uh, Trusted No, right? Yeah. Um, did you already have like a set of partners that you were working with? Or did you have to like go out and hire or a combination of both? 
uh, at your like day zero, uh, what did your team look like? So day zero, I mean, obviously, you know, when, when you're just having the idea at the beginning, you generally don't have partners, but you like to validate an idea, right? So I went out to a couple of peers and just pinged them on the idea. You know, what do you think of, of, of you know, network validation? You know, it's the sort of evolving. I was questioning a couple of things, right? The emergence of proof of stake networks versus proof of work networks. Um, number one, right? The rewards, how do the reward scheme work in a proof of stake network? Um, would people be interested in such a service? And um, as a result, when talking to people in the industry, you automatically get into a slightly technical discussion. And so technical solutions were required and, and you work through those. And that sort of then mutates into the back of a napkin and, and sort of designs. You're in a coffee shop, you're at a bar, you're on a whiteboard, um, and, and et cetera. And so that then sort of became a more of a, a fleshed out picture that went into a bit of a, I put it down into a presentation, you know, sort of maybe five, 10 slides, what this could look like, pain point, usual sort of 10, 10 questions or 10 slides. Um, and yeah, and then sort of had a sort of commercial partner that I was talking to then met, um, a very much like-minded, um, technology individual, Robin, um, who we had a, a lengthier conversation about more a grander philosophical standpoint. And then we mapped out what such an architecture might look like. Um, then found another partner over in Bali, um, who loved this concept and, and was extremely DeFi savvy. And then you just sort of cluster, you build clusters, you arrange calls, you then, um, yeah, pull together, you flesh the idea out further, you push the needle, you then identify what's needed in order to make this happen. What is the MVP the minimum viable product that you need, who are the type of people that you want to bring onto the team to make that happen. Um, and I was very fortunate to actually also being the CEO of Bitcoin.com. So I had an extensive network in terms of super strong skills, in terms of execution, delivery, rolling up your sleeves, moving at crypto speed. And so that's sort of what... Um, pulled together a great marketing talent, a good commercial operational expert alongside a technical and, and my, you know, skill and myself. And then you complement the skills that you have with smarter people around you. And I think that was the sort of key aspect to things. What would you say your main um, core specialty? Is it on the technical side? Is it on the business side, marketing side, maybe legal and compliance? So I'm super useless because I'm a bit of everything. <laughs> uh, I have the ability. I think my strength is really the ability to see how all these wedges fit together. That's my strength, really. I, I have and to have a very good sense of where the direction and in the industry is going. So those two elements to me are really where I think my strength is. And, and, and I needed skill sets to take my technology skills much deeper to really help translate a marketing vision really well. So it resonates with the right kind of audience and demographic to be able to make sure that all the, you know, we, we've got all the necessary and appropriate documentation and funding available to fund and power the movement that we are creating in this direction. Uh, how many people are you guys right now? So at the moment, we're about, I think in total, maybe 12 people, 12, 15 people at Trusted Node. Mm -hmm. And then we've got another same amount that are working on different projects um, associated or linked to Trusted Node. Right. And everyone's uh, decentralized pretty much right now. Yeah, pretty much. I'd say mm -hmm. we're 60% decentralized and then... I'd say 40% of us are actually maybe, yeah, 40% actually less are in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you find, I think like it's an interesting uh, combination because there are a lot of companies that I notice are either fully remote 
um, and there was like a minority of companies that are like located in a specific location. Do you find any, and there are very few companies that are mixed, I, I have to say. Uh, do you find like it's challenging or what are the kind of the main um, obstacles while having part of your team remote and part of your team um, being uh, in one location? Do you have any specific processes to kind of foster the uh, communication between the members of your team? I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely challenging, right? I mean, working remote teams, no doubt about it, right? Especially time zones is is just a simple uh, challenge that you have to address culturally. There's another challenge. There's um, um, delivery, documentation, communication. All of those reflect challenges. But I mean, I, one thing, I was really lucky. I was... Um, I don't know if I'm lucky or not, but I've I worked most of my career as a remote um, uh, individual contributor or manager. Anyway, I never worked, or very little time of my career did I spend in a headquarter per se. And so I was always remote. I always knew and understood how difficult it was, particularly if you were working in a larger organization. And I did work at Sun Microsystems for seven years of my career. Um, and I spent most of that remote and I was responsible for our, you know, corporate development in our mobile business and really glowing our virtual machine on all these mobile handset manufacturers. But we had customers that were global, right? So you had to deal with Korean handset manufacturers, Taiwanese, Chinese, European, Scandinavian, American. Um, and so you were constantly traveling between those markets um, so number one, number two is I never, I didn't live in the, you know, at corporate headquarters. And so as a result, I got very accustomed to waking up at late hours, having, making sure that everybody understood, hey guys, I am on the other end of the call. Your speaker sucks. You cannot hear me and I cannot hear you. You're in a meeting room where you have a group of people in a meeting room and you're you can't hear what anybody's saying you don't ha this was sort of nobody had a skype account set up with a video transmitting at the time as soon as that was possible um all of those things made it really difficult and so now in you know, we have an office in in hong kong so we are a partially a centralized team and at the same time i make it a you know super important we everybody's in a hot hot desk there's no desks here lots of meeting rooms tv screens everywhere super good speaker sets so that everybody can hear you know wirelessly connected screens are running all the time when we had our listing yesterday we had four screens going teams were looping in on those screens they were seeing us we were seeing them they were speaking and it went across the whole office so everybody could hear them. So it really felt like they're a part of the team and included in the momentum, especially if they're remote and not in the same office. Or one guy was in Fukuoka, the other guy was up in Seoul, somebody else was in San, San Diego, um, you know, and then somebody else was in Cannes in France. So how do you facilitate for that and how do you bring that culture together? Somebody was in Holland and then in Bali we had people so we had everybody from everywhere um, and it was just exciting to to go through that and bring that together that's um, and the only way you do that is really yeah we have we have um, weekly all hands every time it's you know and it's sacrificed some people have to get up really early in the morning some people have to stay up really late at night and we rotate, you know, sort of every two months between those sort of time zones and, and those equations so that everybody does meet everybody. And when there's a new joint member joining, I, I put them flat out on the spot and they have to introduce themselves. Yeah, this is really cool. I think a yeah. lot of people are getting a glimpse into what it's like to be working in a, in a, in a crypto company uh, in, in 2021 <laughs> because uh, I think a lot of people are might still be in their like, corporate jobs or might be um, not, yeah. you know, in traditional tech. And, uh, and, and look, it's mm -hmm. Friday night. It's 11 o'clock at night. You're not out in the bars having fun. You're on a call. You've got your team members there. You're launching a new feature. They need an update because it's their Friday morning, wherever they are, right? And so 
you're dealing with that all the time and yeah time zones is definitely something that no one no one prepares you for <laughs> in in college or in high school <laughs> and uh some, something that people need to be aware uh, and be ready to work with if they want to be working full time in in crypto um sure. Cool. So, like, yeah. as you as you scaled, um, I would like to like know more, and I'm sure people here would love to know more about your hiring process and how do you make uh, hiring decisions. Uh, do you have a specific process, and what are the, like the questions that you typically ask uh, when you're interviewing? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. You know, you're always taught in school or at university or at college. You know, this is how you have to go. You have to ask these people through these rigorous question sets and you know one hand i've found that um a couple of different things over my career right so this is this is just sort of more an experience that people that have a consistent desire to learn are really important right so that is one att attribute how do you find that attribute out and how do you um dig into that right oh that a uh, I call it ABL, right? It's always be learning, right? If we're not learning anymore, then we're not pushing our mindsets. We're not evolving as a society or as a human individual. So that was always one aspect. Execution is really important, right? If you say you get something done, we have to be able to rely on each other, particularly if we're remote, that you're going to pick it up and get it done. Even better, if you preempt it, we have a quick chat you then pick up on that idea and the next day you come back and you've already done the idea and you've converted it into a quick PowerPoint for discussion to further elaborate on or dig deeper into and flesh out some of the details. Um, those are elements that are, I think, particularly in crypto, in startup land, are crucial and, and, and hyper important. And as a result, I found that um and i don't mean any disharm to doing an mba or anything but people that have come from sort of very top tier universities have done an mba and you know stayed through that and worked at large companies from their some of their career have not been the best candidates in that mind they've always wanted a team of people to do the work for them um have always tried to analyze a lot of the steps before entering into it as a risk mitigation process. Um, and I feel, at least in crypto land, it's so important to move fast. We know that, the, I mean, just a simple example, the price of a token can go up really quickly. And if you miss that day, you've missed out maybe one year of opportunity. And if we don't execute and deliver on a, a trend, we may miss that whole new trend, right? DeFi, uh, NFTs, DeFi 2, you know, DAOs, right? All of those, et cetera, in crypto land represent significant opportunities that in some cases you don't always know the answers. And we're experimenting all of the time. So how do we make and aggregate as much information, given the time slots that we have, as quick as we possibly can to then be able to execute and make a decision? based on that limited information at that point in time. And hopefully we make the best decision at that time with that limited amount of information, but it's the decision-making that really counts. And you're not always going to have all your bases covered when you make that decision. Now that doesn't answer the interview question, but those are characteristics that I feel really need um, highlighting in, in a crypto area. And that's what I try to extract in an interview. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that is really good and important to, to, to know that, especially for everyone who's uh, trying to break into the industry that yeah. they really need to be hands-on and it's, uh, you know, strategy sessions is something, I mean, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they're important as well, but, uh, yeah. there, there's, they have zero value if you cannot execute on them or if yeah. you expect to delegate to someone else, uh, you really need to be, I feel, a full stack, uh, whether you're technical or non-technical, <laughs> full stack marketing, full stack uh, finance, full stack developer. Um, do you have any favorite um, interview questions that you use to find out the right person? 
Um, I mean, one of my favorite questions is knowing where people want to be in six, 12 months. Specifically six, it's just, usually people ask like, oh, where are you planning to be in five years? But you're asking six to 12 months. Okay. Yes. Well, it, it, mm -hmm. I mean, my view is crypto land is one day in crypto land is seven days anywhere else. So if I ask you yep. one year, that's already seven years, you know, so it's like, yep. <laughs> um, yeah, it's simple as that. And so I think in six months, our landscape changes so much, at least today still. Right. And so as a result, how fast do you want to move? Where do you want to be in six months? And if you're new to crypto, what what do you want to have out of crypto from six months time? Because if you're new to crypto, you're still trying to learn about all the things going on. And where would you like to be in six months? Because by that time, you're going to be fully immersed. You're being paid in crypto. You're, you're, you're having to figure out how to convert your money from crypto into fiat. And then you have to make your bills pay, your electricity bill. You still today, unfortunately, still have to pay in fiat. How do you manage that whole process? You are seeing and being confronted with new token opportunities that you're, you're talking about trading on a day-to-day -day basis with your peer-to-peer -peer colleagues. Where do you want to be in six months? What does that mean for you, mm -hmm. that kind of environment that you're going to be in? And how do you handle that? And, and that's what I try to add, extract in that um, simple question. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, like interview questions where you try to figure out whether the person is really long-term uh, interested in crypto or is, some, or is it someone who just like, you know, heard about a Bitcoin and crypto and the ETH or other altcoins just yesterday and is, you know, they're not even sure whether they want to dedicate their life to it. Uh, do you have any, like any tricky questions that, um, where you kind of try to figure that out? Um, I, 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 Yes and no. I guess you sort of hear that if you tell me that, yeah, I just want to buy some Bitcoin or it's a cool industry to be in. It's like, yeah, you know, you're not going to come into crypto because it's cool, right? You've got to be wanting to really go deep into crypto. And I mean, ultimately, it also comes down a bit to culture. Um, what are your cultural preferences? Why are you interested in crypto? Is it because just to make money, then I don't think that's going to keep you in here in the long run because GIFs to make money, we go through upturns and downturns and the downturns can be significant, right? So there's a, a large element of volatility. You have to be more, yeah, you know, sustainability, you, know, you have to be sustainable to the volatility that we experience. Um, and, and as a result, I feel we're also in, 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 in juris legally, it's not always very clear cut. So it, when we're engaging in certain environments and building new models, it's not always clearly defined the legal framework that we can play in and, and the markets we can operate in. And at the same time, we're competing not only against the incumbents, we're also competing against the regulator who is partially the incumbent as well. So as a result, you need certain characteristics that are slightly nonviolent, you know, disruptors or nonviolent revolutionaries. And that you need to, that needs to come out a bit as well, right? So you want to change the order and it's not around necessarily fighting the existing reality. It's around building something new. What's that new model? And how does this new model make the existing model obsolete? And that's what we are pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, I still think I have a few more questions around yeah. <laughs> like your interview process. I mean, this is, this is, this is definitely great answers. Do, yeah. Have you, have you um, I mean, you've been around for quite a long time and you've kind of met a lot of people in the space and people who, you know, short term, long term. Do you see any like do you have any pet peeves that you really hate when people do or say uh, that is really like a red flag to you that, OK, this person is uh, not going to make it or they're not necessarily fit for for crypto or for your team in particular? Yeah. So so number one, if you're a developer and you don't have a GitHub account, um that's definitely a bit worrying right and so red that's flag. a bit that's a red flag if you're a designer and you don't have a figma account or uh you don't you know you don't have any of the adobe accounts that are out there or 
um, any of the the cloud services, then that's a, a, another um, red flag, I'd say. Um, if you're a UX, I mean, Figma would be more for UX. If you're a UX designer and you don't know how to use Figma, if you don't know how to use a mirror board um, as a business developer to explain, if you don't know how to use Google Sheets and Google Slides, you know, those are all sort of um, tools that in a distributed, decentralized world, you have to be able to use. You have to feel super comfortable working with because that's the only way you can communicate in a decentralized fashion and you can express um, your experience. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, and I'm sure in this room as well, a lot of people who are not yet full-time in crypto and yeah. they, you know, they maybe just started trading. They're trying to like, you know, ape into different, you know, liquidity pools and tokens. Oh. Uh, but they realize that okay, they actually want to do something more just th than just like hodling or trading. Uh, for you mentioned kind of your your requirements for different roles and like your expectations. Yeah. But do you have any more specific tips for someone who is like really passionate about the space, but they're not exactly sure how to get in and how to stand out among all the other applicants that are applying to? to to work for you for example so one 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 question i did forget to ask this but uh, one question <laughs> i do ask all the time is we we pay everybody in crypto a hundred percent in crypto are you willing to accept your uh, full salary in crypto <laughs> um and it doesn't necessarily need to be you know the token that we are building and and stuff like that it can also be a stable coin so it can be Bitcoin Cash, it can be, you know, a, a solid coin. But are you willing to accept 100% for your time and your effort and your work, um, crypto? And I think that's a core question. If you um, are not in crypto yet, have you tried using a non-custodial wallet? Do you have a MetaMask? Have you downloaded a wallet? Um, have you... I think those are questions you need to have. You use the Kepler. Do you know a Phantom Wallet? Um, you know all of you know Kep. You know sort of Terra Station. Have you done anything in you know using a Collateral Vault? Have you done any lending, any staking, any farming? You know um, I think those would all help in building out a bit of experience that you can provide and make you stand out in an interview. Um, because the design elements on using these features, the experience in terms of being able to, how many sign you need to sign off, you need to click. Those are all critical elements in anything you're doing in crypto, unless you're working for a centralized exchange, unless you're working for a legal required custodian, unless you're working for a professional other people manager, you know, other people money manager of funds, then I think then you don't necessarily need to do all of that because you're under a totally different legal requirements. But if you're in crypto and I view crypto as being fully non-custodial and learning how to use the blockchain as the custody, um, those are things that you really need. Mm -hmm. I think these are like the, the points that I would also recommend a lot of people just to interact with uh, with the chain directly instead of uh, just keeping all their coins uh, and assets on, on, on an exchange. Just download yeah. it while it's started interacting. And surprising amount of people uh, who hold crypto, they don't even do that. They don't self-custody. They do not know how to get started. And they're, I think a lot of people are afraid of uh, significant fees that in, uh, can be involved yeah. in that process. Yeah. Uh, it really depends on which chain you're on. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's like a whole a whole spectrum of what you can be used, what you can use today, um, and I think there is no excuse uh, not to be able to like download a wallet, start interacting with the DeFi and the NFT platforms, and uh, you know transferring uh, assets. Um, I think, and, mm -hmm. yeah, just as you said, Roman. I mean, it's like, but nowadays, right? I mean, how do you find? I mean, it's like, I feel that. Today, you've got Ethereum, you've got, you know, that's the, maybe you pay high gas fees and Bitcoin, you know, really has become sort of pretty much the, the, a gold. So we don't really move much around in terms of Bitcoin, but you move a lot around in Ethereum and then you realize you're paying a hundred dollar gas fee or whatever. But nowadays you have Terra, you have, you know, Solana, you have, 
um, Avalanche, you have Phantom, right? All these other networks where the moving of funds has become a lot easier. There are newer wallets out there with newer technologies that make it a lot more user friendly. Um, so hopefully at that experimentation, that playing around is really important versus paying $200,000 a year to go to a big university. I think that's going to get you much further and help you on a path of creating personal wealth, um, far greater than, than anything else would do is my view. Mm, 100%. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the uh, I think next important question, who are you guys <laughs> hiring right now? So we hire generally in, in three categories, really, um, is, is sort of where we spend most of our efforts. One is developers, right? Uh, software engineers, uh, DevOps, um, Solidity developers, DeFi experienced, um, you know, architects, um, you know, blockchain architects. Those, I'd say, are, are, is one sort of bucket of resources that we look for. Really, um, developers with DeFi experience experience and blockchain experience mm -hmm. so that's number, the number one mm -hmm. yeah number one the number two bucket is really usability user experience right so how do i find um, a great ability to convert whatever we're working on into a nice design right so that people can navigate and taking into account the DeFi trends, the decentralized generation who are using these products, and then ultimately the underlying technology and what is needed to be able to click through and use those technologies. So that's sort of the next bucket, usability and the design associated with usability. Lastly, it's sort of the marketing and distribution. And in marketing and distribution, it's really... Um, you know, how to communicate, how to grow communities, how to build in social media, Twitter, Medium, YouTube, um, you know, Reddit. Those are all critical elements in terms of interacting, Telegram, interacting and communicating with a community. The community is the life and blood of every product that we build out in crypto land. How do I build and connect and sustain a relationship with decentralized online, in some cases, anonymous, pseudo anonymous, or even educated individuals, right? That is a critical element. And as a part of that, also distribution, I need to make sure that I plant my product in terms of, you know, from a business development perspective with the right partners, I have the right connections, I know where to go if I need to do a cross bridge um, solution, I need to know who to talk to if I need um, some sort of custodial partnership. I need to know who to talk to to get listed on a specific exchange, what forms to fill out, where do I go to get a grant from a, uh, an, a, a, a foundation on a blockchain, etc. And so those are all things that ultimately are automated, but there are still anonymous, pseudo-anonymous or normal people that, or, or visual people on each of the other ends of these products. How do I interact with them and, and connect with them uh, from a business development standpoint? That is sort of the third bucket, marketing and business development. Okay, so, and uh, what's the best way for people to, to apply? Shall they just DM you guys on Twitter? Um, yeah, go to trustednode.io, srust99, tweet me anytime. You can reach me out on Telegram with that, with that handle. Um, that works as well. And, you know, um, yeah. And on our LinkedIn page, um, all of those sites um, are available where you can reach out to me, us. Um, and I think Jake's on the call or you go to at trusted node underscore IO. That's our original um, Twitter handle. And we will respond on there. Yeah, and I believe you guys still have a few job ads live on crypto jobs as well. <laughs> Don't yeah, mean we to make do. a plug, hey, sorry, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a useful way to apply as well. <laughs> of course, you got to go to crypto <laughs> crypto jobs list. So there you go. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, like in the end of the day, uh, for me and for us, like what we want to see is. Uh, more companies expanding in this space and i yep. personally don't really care how they apply as long as you guys are successful and uh 
the space grows and you help push the space forward. And the but same goes for applicants. So the service <laughs> you're providing is is really an amazing service because number one, you help target and create discovery in an industry that has been banned, shunned upon, locked into a Reddit, you know, sort of black room on the dark web. You started and created, you know, you created new ground by creating a jobs list for everybody in crypto land where it was targeted, it was focused, it was open. And, you know, I mean, Google, Facebook, they all banned everything crypto in 2017, right? Yeah. And, and now all of a sudden, oh, we love Twitter. You know, we all love crypto now. But, you know, in the hard times when it was tough, you know, they weren't there to support us. They kowtowed. And what does that mean when it gets hard again? They're likely to do exactly the same. So how loyal are they going to be? And I much prefer to be loyal to people that are committed and are true believers in seeing the opportunity that crypto presents. And, and that's why I think what you're doing, Raman, is, is fantastic, right? And we need more of what you're doing as well. Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> Huge thanks. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I do remember in, 20, in 2018, uh, Google deranked uh, a lot of crypto-related sites. Yeah. Uh, we were a part of that batch as well, so we saw like, a significant decrease in traffic. But uh, right. yeah, it was it was very very depressing. Like in addition to the drop of the uh, uh, price, but you also see a drop in the um, in the number of uh, traffic you're getting just because Google decides not to like you. And I believe like CCN or some other uh, Bitcoin uh, related or crypto related uh, publication, which just like went out or completely. Went out of business uh, went out just of because, business. yeah, um, just because of the Google update, and the same went for the um, for the YouTube. Sorry, not YouTube, but for the Facebook ads. Facebook, um, Facebook ads, right? I mean, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I mean, they banned us all from an mm -hmm. advertising platform, and yeah, you know, it's like I remember the traffic just <laughs> dropped to grounds. I mean, it came to a grinding halt, right? It's like you're driving at three hundred miles an hour with your page views and your interaction and you hit a hard brick wall and come to an immediate stop. And all of a sudden you need to reconfigure, recompile, reset all your benchmarks in terms of numbers, metrics, um, sources of where you find traffic. And you then have to dig deep to really be creative and find new sources and new um, traffic and audience. Yeah, well, we're, we're hoping to have a bit more decentralized platforms where we can yeah, connect. Exactly. Uh, fortunately, think, Twitter so far has been all right. I, I think yeah. uh, they haven't made any, I mean, they did a, a few mistakes. I feel they recently banned uh, like some major uh, Bitcoin contributor for his views on COVID. <laughs> and uh, I hope this, this this group doesn't get banned <laughs> just because I just mentioned the word, <laughs> the C word. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> um, Right. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, quite but, interesting how the space developed over the years. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, partially why we set up was, you know, sent, I mean, Bitcoin was originally set up as censorship resistant, immutable, right? And and I think over time, we have, you know, at, at we, we maybe we got accustomed to or, you know, we still need to remember that we are still about censorship resist. You should be able to say the C word or you should be able to express your opinions, whether they're you know politically correct or not. But I think, you know, we need the conversation between different parties. It's so important that we can have an open conversation because conversation allows for interaction. Interaction creates a understanding or not understanding amongst each other, but it still facilitates the truth and a honest situation of where we are and where frustrations may lie or not, and how we decompress or alleviate some of the pressure associated with where the frustrations are and mm -hmm. mitigate any kind of, yeah, um, yeah, violence. I mean, you know, that's that's really why I feel this censorship resistance, um, the immutability. You say something, it should be out there, and it should always be out there. And and you know, I can take, you know, I can apologize for it. I can say I was wrong, but we must also forgive, right? And um, I feel those are important elements to our society on a global planet where we are today. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, 100% agree with you. Uh, yeah. I think there is way too much censorship going on in the past several years. We've seen the consequences of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think one of, one, of the, one of the things that he mentioned is about uh, how crypto is being based on like a lot of anonymous contributors. Um, I think like I have a controversial question. Would you, would you hire someone is compl- who is completely anonymous uh, if someone kind of knocked on your door? Um, or how would you handle that situation? So they generally don't knock on the door, but they would <laughs> they would knock on my Telegram or yeah, right. <laughs> knock on my Reddit account or something. And and yes, I would hire somebody anonymous if they can get the job done. Yes, I would definitely hire them anonymously. Cool. Yeah, interesting. So far, uh, our previous guests were <laughs> not not as approving uh, for various reasons. But it's it's super cool. Uh, th- this is what with, we're here for. <laughs> I, I I can tell you, I I, I have. Yeah, I'm working with anonymous participants right now. Right. Yeah, this is amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, do you think we shall we shall open up uh, to questions? I think we have two people queued up uh, have a request to speak. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Or is is there any questions that I haven't asked that I probably should ask you before we open up to the uh, to Q and A? No, I think you've asked a lot of the questions, and you know, if you if if they do come to mind again, you know, bring bring them up. But I mean, for me. Yeah, happy to facilitate questions from, you know, the people, you know, the participants in this yeah. in this chat group. So yeah, super cool. Awesome, awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks so much once again. Uh, okay, we're gonna start accepting uh, requests to speak. All right, um, Twitter doesn't make it very easy to uh, kind of sort who went who was first, <laughs> but uh, yep. on my list, I think Let's it's uh, it. Sherry, and then. Uh, Dushant Kumar and then Satoshi Lands. Uh, I think in that order that they requested. Uh, forgive me if it wasn't the order, but uh, okay, let's go. Hello, um, Sherry's connecting. Hello, hello everybody. It's a lovely conversation to listen to. I'm Sherry, and I'm part of the Bitcoin volunteer as part of the Bitcoin Cash Group. And oh, and right. um, when you guys were talking about censorship, I'm like, yes, you're very right. We should have free discussions and and all that. So good points. The thing I was going to ask you, I guess in Bitcoin Cash, we've been focusing on making everything easy, user-friendly from a, a pleb, pleb perspective or new people coming into the, the market. And, um, you know, you were talking about all the things that you want to focus on. And I'm wondering... How much market research do you guys do? Like, do you actually survey people coming into the market or people who aren't in the market yet to try and get an understanding of how they feel about jumping in and what sort of user experience they want? Yeah, really good question. I mean, you know, it's like, and yeah, so I spend a lot of time at Bitcoin and trying to get newbies into crypto land and, and, and sort of entice them. And I've, I've spent in mobile, I got, I remember spending a lot of time trying to educate people about the opportunity that mobile presents as well. Um, and I sort of come to the conclusion that for newer audiences and newer demographic or, or, existing you know uh, one of the toys is oh i want my mother to use crypto and it's like um i want my father to use crypto or whatever the you know i just feel we decided to take a different approach based on my track record of trying to convince enterprise institutions um and non you know it's like uh non at least mobile buffs to come into mobile world and take that experience into crypto where this time around, I'm saying I just want to focus on what I call, we call here, degens. And I don't mean the degenerates. I mean the decentralized generation. Um, and the decentralized generation, in my view, is um, we've broken down the market segment into 500 million people worldwide based on what you read on Binance and, 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 and Coinbase and decentralized exchanges own crypto. And if 500 million people own crypto how many of those are really de you know decentralized generation and we believe that to be maybe only 10 to 20 million people and those 10 to 20 million people are sitting on a net asset value of 20 percent in crypto so that means they own of everything they own 20 percent is roughly in crypto and we think 
that over the next three years, because of the yield generating opportunities in crypto land, because of the airdrops that you're going to receive and the I call it UBI for lack of a better name, but because of that UBI that you get in crypto land, that yeah, demographic is going to grow 30, 40 X and we're going to hit maybe 300, 400, 500 million of people in decentralized generation. Where are they going to come from? They're going to come from what we call hi-fi, right? People already in hybrid finance. So the people that are using a Celsius network, people that are using BlockFi that already are seeing, I'm getting a 6% reward for my ETH. But oh man, over there, I get, you know, a 30% APY on my ETH or I get, you know, I get free airdrops over there. How do I go over there? And they're the ones that are going to come in. And I think it's going to be more participants that are on Revolut, you know, the next generation, the Robin Hoods that are really trying to break through and, and really go deep into crypto land and find these rewards and these new wealth generating opportunities. That's how we've broken it down. Do we read research from a Price Waterhouse or Deloitte or an Ernst & Young? No way, right? I think they're so out of touch. They're going to build something that their customers want to see, e.g. banks, e.g. insurance companies, e.g. industrial providers or supply chain companies. So it's going to be so irrelevant for what we're trying to achieve in Decentraland. Or that's sort of really why, um, yeah, we're excited about that. And yeah, I can, we, un I can yeah. understand that because um, uh, in Australia, I don't know if you've heard, Commonwealth Bank, that the biggest bank in Australia, is trying yeah. um, crypto trading with its customers. But there's you can't withdraw it. You can't do anything with your crypto. You can only trade it. But there are no other incentives. So I guess what I'm saying is, like, we do need to research how to – not research through other corporations – but I guess with your own company, you know, what draws people in? And, and it sounds, yeah. sounds as though you're already doing that. So yeah. you've answered my question. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Sherry. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Sherry. All right. Next up, um, Dushant, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Dushant, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, it's correct. Uh, it's awesome. uh, Dushant. Uh, should uh, you question? I yeah. just want to know. I am from non-technical background, uh, so lots of uh, positions I see on uh, crypto uh, currency background that is from technical background, right? So how I can get uh, jobs on this non-technical background? Basically, I have uh, two years of experience in uh, regarding customer relations and all. Uh, now I am working for a Qatar-based company. Uh, it's a uh, completely remote work as a mm -hmm. client service manager. I am working here. And what do you do work? Sorry, I didn't understand. What What are you working on today? You have two years experience in doing, and what are you doing for the Qatari company now? Uh, basically, uh, past experience is in uh, insurance field. Okay. Regarding customer relations. Yeah, I mean, customer relations. Uh, okay. I mean, I don't know what you want to do and, and your background, but I do think that if you want to enter into crypto, I mean, one of the industries, you know, I would look at if you have industrial experience in insurance and you know how to deal with customer support, um, you know, a lot of crypto companies need customer support and are looking. Yeah, to yeah strengthen, basically I'm you know, looking for this uh, customer support uh, type of work. Yeah, perfect. I mean, you can go, I mean, you just go to a number of sites. Do they have a, a, a intercom? Do they use Zendesk? What solutions are they using or Odesk or anything? And you can uh, go basically to... Basically, I yeah. learned uh, Freshdesk. Yeah, you know okay. Freshdesk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Freshdesk. So, I mean, same, so I same similar. Idea. Yeah, so how do you help these crypto companies? One thing, again, I sort of come back to the point that we talked about earlier learn how to use some of these crypto sites so you then can understand what they lack in yeah basically uh i'm using right now lots of crypto exchanges like uh wazir x uh, bid yeah. yeah uh coin dcx so guess. i'm sure each one of them have have support requirements right um, they're asking for help in support and if it's not on crypto job list where there's a whole section of 
people for support you know i would i would start there and and, and really take a look at right now i am talking uh, recently i talked with a relationship manager in uh, bid bns exchange uh, they are expanding their customer the uh, customer care team yeah but the thing is uh, they going to have a uh, freshers not experienced have- person yeah Oh, okay. They want new people. They don't want experienced people. Yeah, I think I just wanted to comment here, uh, Shandi. It's, a, it's an amazing question. And I think uh, for someone with your background and customer support, uh, that role is definitely in demand in crypto. You either just can head out to, to our site, to Crypto Jobs List, or even go directly to uh, the kind of larger mid-scale companies. They usually need uh, quite a lot of support. Like even even we internally, we have yeah. a person who is helping us out uh, with. Like I even do it right now myself. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, especially exchanges, even, even more so exchanges. They need uh, help replying to customers, explaining how the product works, explaining what happens if they send the funds on like layer two solution versus on mainnet, or what's the difference if someone sent funds on like different forks of Bitcoin and what's going to happen to those funds. Uh, so definitely uh, people in, with your background are needed in the market. And uh, just, you know, be very clear when you're applying to uh, companies that you're customer support professional and you would want to help them out and make sure you do have all the relevant knowledge and experience working with uh, as many blockchains as possible and make sure to have kind of experience the problems that people are experiencing uh, so that you're able to relate to uh, them and apply successfully to companies. Uh just now in this company, uh, they are also going to launch its own cryptocurrency. Mm. Uh, so we but are think, promoting its uh, basic uh, coin launch. Here. I see. I think yeah. I think uh, the question yeah. is getting out of the yeah. topic. Okay, okay, sure. Dushyant, no, but... what I would say is, is, dude, don't focus only on one company. Go to many, right? Don't get your hands pinned. You know, don't get pinned down on one. There are so many crypto companies. Focus on multiple. Some people will have younger din- people. They want some people want experience. Don't get pinned on one company and one opportunity. Crypto land is beautiful because it's online. Everything's digital, and you can move from opportunity to opportunity based on the choices. It's about you choose. You make the choice, and you go in, and you have the choice. So. You know, we're all about making available the right to choose. And, and so that's my advice to you. Thank you, Zishant, once again. Uh, all right. We Next up is Satoshi, Satoshi Lands. Hello. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Uh, I'm just creating my company because it was pretty difficult for me to find a job in the crypto world. I'm from France, so I speak. I'm a native French speaker, but I used to live in in New York City. And uh, thank you first. And uh, I totally agree about what you say about the crypto world. I think we're living a, a big, a big change, and uh, a new paradigm is coming. And uh, my goal, I try to find a job in the crypto world because my goal is to. The thing is. 300 million people speak French all around the world. And the thing is, few people, few French speakers speak and understand English. So the goal of my company, or if I can find a job, is to translate all the contents in English to, like that, more people, more people who speak French will be able to integrate the crypto world. So I would like to know something. Is it difficult? Uh, w- w- will it be, sorry, difficult to, uh, to work with a company and tell to the company, okay, a lot of people speak French. These people don't understand and speak English. You should uh, have uh, customer support in France, in French, sorry. Uh, you should tr- translate all of your website in French. You should bring uh, and build a French community, for example, or they think that uh, English should be the main language and uh, there is nothing we can do about it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very <laughs> interesting question. So I'll answer that in a, in a bit of a roundabout way. 
Number one is I, my co-founder is French. My okay. lead developer is French. And okay. And my product manager for Trusted Node is French. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So number one, no, they all speak English and they love to speak English. In fact, yeah. one of them, I won't say which one, wants to not have an Inc a French accent. That's his prime objective, right? Yes, um, that's my goal too. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> so great. Um, and, and, and the other, so, so I don't think, you know, crypto, the beauty is borders don't matter. Language doesn't matter as long as we can communicate with each other. When it comes to acquiring users to use the product, the more French users I have, and I need to build an interface in French to support those French users because they're uncomfortable in writing comments in, in English, then I will do that, right? But um, it is the market demand that will drive a conversation and will influence my allocation of resources towards a specific language or a specific technology or you know a specific geography so that's what i would sort of say to that um, okay. and i want to give a little anecdote right and this was back in 2017 and i know some of the people in this audience will know what i'm talking about but there was one blockchain that launched in 2017, went live, and they had developers from around the world, right? And there were a core lead of developers that were 50 of them around the world that were involved in accepting or not accepting. Uh, sorry. Looks like Stefan's uh, internet connection went down. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. Can I talk? Or we have yeah, to go ahead. Yeah. Let's wait for Stefan to come back. But yeah, definitely you can go ahead. I also had okay. a few comments about, about your question. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is, uh, yeah, a lot of people speak French and don't speak and understand English. And... Uh, I think uh, this is what I'm trying to build with my company. I want to cre create sorry, a mirror of a company uh, in French, like uh, the Telegram group, Twitter, uh, internet, website, video, uh, translate all the contents. Because what I see is I, I have a lot of friends. They don't speak English. It's pretty difficult for them to speak English and understand English. So, uh, so they want to invest in, in crypto, but when they see uh, blockchains, scalability, all these, uh, all these terms, all these words, it's, it's like, it's like, a, uh, how to say that? It's like they, uh, they don't want to invest because it's too complicated for them. It's like a, it's like a, they are, uh, they are, you, uh, you afraid about what you can't uh, understand. And uh, that's what they're leaving that. Yep. Cool. Uh, I'm not sure if Stefan is back with us. Uh, Stefan, you are currently muted, so you can unmute yourself if you wanted to comment. Uh, I think we can hear you, Stefan. Maybe not. Um, Nothing's coming out. Um, yeah, I can just comment in the meantime while Stefan is reconnecting. Uh, I, I, Satosh, I think there's a bit of a feedback from your speaker. Uh, anyway, so like I would say that there's definitely a lot of value in in translating content and internationalizing uh, and internationalizing the content into other languages, um, especially like I know a lot of exchanges they have these initiatives where they basically uh, hire someone in a specific geography or a country and then they will uh like a country ambassador and then they will let, let them run a community a telegram channel in their native language so i do actually have a friend who is also a part of crypto jobless community who is in netherlands and he helps out with okx a community there 
And it's like, you know, he leverages his native language and he helps uh, kind of bootstrap the community there and answer a lot of questions in, in his native language. And I think the same thing goes with, with French. And to my personal knowledge, there are quite a lot of uh, people in, uh, in French community. Like, you know, Ledger is a French company, probably one of the most known French uh, crypto company out there. There is XDeFi Wallet. And as to my knowledge, the kind of the startup crypto startup space in, in, in France is pretty big. Um, even crypto jobs, we are here like do internationalization as well. And I think, I'm not sure if, if we finally added French language or not, but that's something that we kind of accept kind of open source contributions to uh, internationalization. Um, yeah, so I think there, is a, there are legs to your idea um, and kind of just translating as much content as possible and uh, getting more people from France into crypto. Stephanie, you're with us, by the way? Yeah, anyway, yeah. I don't know. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened. I just went silent mic, but uh, anyway, back again. Jack Dorsey is making evil experiments today. <laughs> <laughs> Twice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we will remember that. Uh, T- tend to build uh, decentralized uh, Twitter spaces. Twitter spaces, yeah. Uh, did you have any more comments to this, Stefan? Yeah, no, it was just, it was, to me, that was a real fascinating moment when that would launched and, and what that meant and, and, and sort of how to, um, yeah, just what that meant, that how cosmopolitan the world has become and, and what that meant in terms of different nation- nationalities and, and, and what languages people are going to be using to communicate with each other. Cool. Um, yeah. All right. Let's. We have a few more speakers. Uh, Satoshi Lance. Hope we answered your question. Uh, yes. Thank hope you. That thank was uh, useful. Thank Feel you free to much. just like tweet as a reply to this to this uh, uh, thread, thank so you, we you. can uh, maybe comment in, in tweets. All right. Next up is uh, Doctor Stonks. Uh, very lovely uh, Twitter name. cover. Yeah, cool name. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. How, um, now I've got a kind of a uh, I, I apologize if this has been asked um earlier in the space i did join late um but i saw the name of the space and i was like oh this is quite interesting to me because um since you know just falling you know really in love with uh everything DeFi, just from you know my personal use not working in the space or anything i have been really motivated to you know find a career you know in this kind of area um, but coming from com- coming from what I do um, in uh, restaurant management, um, you know, it's there's like, it, there's not many transferable skills there, and you know, I'm kind of looking at my part, my avenues. Um, you know, do I put everything down for two years and learn how to code, um, or you know, like what? I guess what what is a uh, what is an entry level uh, foot in the door um, into this this sector? I mean, what do you have? Do you like coding? Do you like being behind a computer screen? Um, it, I like. I have I have very little uh, experience of it, but it is something that I am really interested in. Yeah, I mean, maybe one way is to take a course, right, and 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 sort of get a feel for if this is something you want to do. But I mean, in order to get into crypto, you don't necessarily need to go the route of a, of a coder. I mean, it offered, obviously is super cool to, if you do that. There's a huge demand for engineering resources, particularly experienced Solidity developers, people that know how to build in DeFi or that have experience in creating smart contracts, um, let alone front-end designers who know how to build a user experience for um DeFi users, right? And so there's a big demand there, but you have to know if that's for you, right? You're going to be spending, you know, a large, I mean, most of us in crypto land, we spend a lot of hours from our early mornings through late nights, um, pretty much every day working in crypto land. If you like coding and you love the gratification that you know, a compiled solution really works. And um, yeah, then then that's definitely something for you. There's no better gratification than working with open source code base, forking that, um, compiling an, an adjustment to that 
um, and then having that audited and approved and seeing users ape into that, there's nothing more gratifying than that. And so um, I would suggest, you know, a mutual friend, you know, there are lots of courses, tools to use. Um, the best online one I would recommend is check, take, a, take a course at Morales um, and have a look at what they're offering. Uh, Ivan on Tech has, has a great solution, tool sets, and lots of uh, video content that allows you to go remote and, and play around with um, a simple tool sets. So check that out. Yeah, I just Thank wanted you. to comment. I, I, I appreciate it. Just wanted to comment as well. Yeah, there is also like DAP University and uh, oh, Eat the yeah. Blocks if you're interested yep. in like, Solidity development. But uh, again, outside of engineering and development, uh, I would I would disagree with you that you don't have any transferable skills. Uh, I think just being organized and being and getting things done is a very important yeah. kind of general skill that not a lot of people have, even though they think they do. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of a lot of opportunities for someone who is non technical, uh, anywhere from marketing, writing content, creating memes, oh, yeah. uh, just organizing a project, uh, organizing you know even even Twitter Spaces, right? Organizing Twitter Spaces, organizing podcast sessions, curating content. There is a lot, a lot, a lot of work done that is need to be done outside of engineering. So, uh, and again, like you need, it needs, it's really up to you to decide whether engineering is something you want to like invest yeah. yourself in, uh, because it's uh, you know the entry bar might be a bit higher. Uh, but again, g- give it a try. Maybe it's uh, not as hard for you as uh, other people's other people say. Uh, but yeah, just figure out what you want to do. And uh, definitely there are a lot of opportunities on both camps, technical and non-technical. And I would just add to that sort of Rama. It's just like really, it's super important to be able, copywriting is another area that I yep. might have not mentioned. In, in being able to translate this complexity of blockchain, what DeFi means into super simple five lines with an image is is really really important and a skill set that is really hard to find in this industry yeah that's that's great thank you guys so much i really appreciate yeah. it cool thanks so much uh dr stonks uh vignesh i think had something to say he has his hand raised for quite some time you don't yeah. want to comment or something yeah yeah, yeah. uh hey stefan so uh i heard like you said you're comfortable with uh, hiring anons and yeah. uh, this kind of like comes from like uh, another person we kind of interviewed a few weeks ago so had like a very valid point like he said uh, it is very hard to kind of like have uh, a real sense of accountability when when it comes to hiring anons so like how do you kind of uh, manage that um yeah i mean I mean, how do I manage hiring anons? I mean, reputation really matters, right? So if you're an anon, you know, it's like either you've been recommended through somebody um, or you can give me a, another anon as a reference um, or you, we've had experience working on a small project together. And if you, I did not have any recommendation, I did not have any background on you, I would start on something really small or you're sharing with me your GitHub repo and your GitHub repo is rock solid and you've contributed in hundreds of different codes. You've got lots of reviews. You've got 27, you know, 27,000 commits or whatever it might be. Then you're a rock star. And to me, you as a rock star, I don't really care about your background. I care about your execution and your delivery. And, and I will look at that um, as a counterpart. And if you have none of that and you're just new and you want to stay anon, um, Maybe we start on something really small. I'll take a tiny little project and we'll test that out. And if that is good, then we'll figure out how we can scale that. If it's not so good, then we'll we'll go our separate ways. But that might be those would be all different angles that I would consider as an anon. Solid answer. Yeah. Hope that answered the question. Uh, all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think next up we have MP. Hi, good good day, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you for holding uh, spaces like this. It's very useful for uh, newcomers to the industry like us. Uh, the question I had was, uh, I, I, you know, one of the things that I've found uh, in this industry is the, you know, the growth of DAOs. How do you see that going? And how do you see the, um, uh, or is there a place where both DAOs and like 
for example, I want to, you know, work for for some NGO DAOs, but it's very hard to search and and filter and and get to the right DAO or select the right DAO. Is there a is there a match that can happen towards where we can find these things through crypto job or maybe it already is and I don't know about it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, no, it's like I mean, if you want to work at a DAO, I mean, I think the DAOs are the future, right? And so we've set up all our companies as foundations and then created a DAO. As a result out of it, and our next project is a full DAO. We have no incorporation anywhere, nothing. Um, and if I were looking to get a job in DAO, if there's nothing posted on on, on crypto jobs list, I would go to you know look at Aragon. Who's got something going on Aragon? Who are the companies on there? Um, who are the companies on Moloch DAO? Who are the companies you know? Um, in in what's it snapshot in boardroom right those are all tools that people use that want to build a DAO and you know if you're an NGO I'm an advisor to two DAOs one is a company called Haifa Haifa DAO um, or do D H O they call themselves a decentralized human organization um, but uh, Haifa which is a part of the Seeds Group um, and JoinSeeds.com um, so have a look at that. Um, they're an NGO. They're looking at um, more sort of uh, impact-related projects. And so that might be another opportunity. But my first place to go would be Aragon, Snapshot, Boardroom, um, and then maybe Moloch DAO or some of the – and there's a DAO board. I can't remember what the name is. DAO something rather. But if you do a Google search, DAO ranking or something like that, you'll you'll see you'll see something there. Oh, thank you. Actually, you know, another thing I want to share for any newcomers out there, it, it's become so easy. Actually, I was op- able to open my own DAO on Sputnik DAO. That's on Near Protocol. There you go. So anybody, yeah. you know, I, I'm 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 40 years old. So anybody who's uh, in this call thinking that this is complicated, I think things are becoming easier. And again, guidance from people like you, groups like this, is is very helpful. So thank you again. Yeah, so reach out to me. Send me your your contacts. You seem to have gone way deeper than I have. I didn't know about Sputnik DAO, so I'm going to check that out. Definitely. Thank you very much, Stefan. I will send you a message. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing. Um, All right. Uh, This is a great question, MP. Thanks so much. I think we have uh, Sachin next. Hi. Uh, Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask, like, how do you think is like with the gas fees being so high, do you think we'd be able to move from, say, wire transfer so easily because the gas fees is taking a few chunk of, say, cryptos, like everyone holding coins and stuff and then pushing out so much gas fees into the system. So that that makes me wonder, like, if you're going to like if people are going to actually move away from wire transfers. So I just did a video post on gas fees and look, I'm, I, I loved Ethereum and I still love Ethereum for what they have done and, and how they've created um, all of this innovation and this smart contract. I'm just a bit upset that the gas fees are so high for every little transaction. And I was just talking to somebody this morning, um, their expenditure on gas fee is now excess of what they pay in food per month is in excess of what they pay in rent per month. So when your gas fees are higher than your food and your rent, then then something's not quite right. Um, but it's still the hub of all inflation, uh, innovation, sorry, not inflation, of innovation. Um, and so that's one thing that speaks for Ethereum. Nonetheless, you have projects like Near Protocol, you have Solana, you have Binance Smart Chain, you have Polygon, you have ZK Sync that's just about to launch, you have Arbitrum, you have um, you know, Avalanche, you have Terra. All of these other networks are setting themselves up and building out their presence um, and their communities. As their communities grow, their fees today are still super low. So you can do a lot of transactions, you can do all the trades. And you have all the big exchanges like Ave, like Sushi, you know, Sushi, the whole Sushi group. Um, um, all of them are now available on multiple chains as well. So you get their whole communities coming and moving across the chain. So the gas fees today, 
um, are, uh, are going to be a problem of yesterday. And tomorrow we're going to be back to an environment where we have super low gas fees. And if you remember, that was sort of the main reason why Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core forked. The gas fees on Bitcoin Core were just super high and super slow that resulted in bigger block discussion, which led to um, Bitcoin Cash, ultimately, that allows for extremely fast transactions, faster than you can hit go. And then number two, at an amazingly low cost, next to free. So if you're caring about peer-to-peer transfers and remittances, there's a solution for you amongst all the other capabilities and smart contracts that are available on all different platforms. Yeah. Just a reminder that just remind that, you know, the future is probably going to be multi-chain and uh, yes. all these uh, speed and low fees, they're always uh, come across, come at cost of decentralization. So I think that's an important thing to, to remember for some people who are moving, you know, uh, uh, seven, eight, 10 digits of value uh, on the chain, they would rather, pref- you know, they don't mind spending uh, yeah. hungry dollars to move that value, knowing that they cannot be, that transaction cannot be reversed uh, and they're okay paying uh, slightly higher fees on, on Ethereum uh, or, you know, actually Bitcoin chain, you know, you can, you can move a lot of money for like two yeah. cents per byte, which is literally less than a dollar. And I think uh, the times are gone. I mean, like, with, 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 the, with the SegWit, uh, and now with Taproot, uh, the fee is going to go even lower. Um, but yeah, there are a bunch of other networks out there that you can use to transfer things cheaply. Um, and uh, yeah, and experiment with them. Yeah, I think it's just like a, a trade-off that you need to realize. I think for small amounts of money, for like several thousands of dollars, there is no harm using something that is much cheaper, like you know Solana, BCH, uh, Tron, uh, kind of BSC, Binance Smart Chain, etc. Uh, but you kind of you need to understand why why uh, that is happening, why the fees are much lower, and why uh, certain transactions are faster. Sure, thanks. Cool. Thanks so much for the question. Uh, MP had a follow up question, I believe, and then we have Moonstar. Sure. Just just a quick thing I wanted to share with the previous caller from my recent experiences. Uh, the near protocol has like uh, um, even the fees are so low that you can't even account for them. And I found the same experience <laughs> with Cello protocol. It's very easy. Uh, you know, my mom can use it. So we are getting there. So if you want to try it, please give these uh, protocols a try, and hopefully you will enjoy them. I noticed that there was a bridge that was built uh, that that launched on near yesterday with EVM. So that's also very exciting. Thank Sounds you. like you want to hire your entire family, MP. If, if your mom is so in, <laughs> up to date with the tech, we want to we want your your whole family on board. <laughs> Thank you. You know, one of the things that I, I I make it a point that I have an 11 year old son and my mom is 65. I show all the apps to them, and if it makes sense, then I will put some money into it. And if it doesn't make sense, then no point, right? That's an interesting filter. Uh, are your kids playing Axie yet, or are there play Terran games? Uh, he, my my son is trying out two different games right now, uh, but they're not launched yet. So we're playing around with that. Axie, we have uh, we've played Axie, but he doesn't like it. So other things like eleven year old kids have different preferences. Then there we go. Alpha, <laughs> alpha, alpha signal. Uh, short Axies. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I I like Axie personally. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Did we have any more questions from the audience? I think someone was asking to be a asking a microphone request. Any more questions? Uh, how are you feeling, Stefan? Uh, shall we give it another 10, 20, 30 minutes? Shall we wrap it up faster than that? Stefan? No, I, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have any. Shall we keep questions. going? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, shall no, we keep sorry. going? Right. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> If you, um, yeah, I mean, if I could, I'm happy to take maybe one or two more questions sure. and then I think we can wrap it on. Okay. Okay. Uh, and yeah. you, okay. Vahid. Vahid is asking. Ah, there you so go. Good. That's, that's good. Always Vahid. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. 10 more minutes and then we'll be uh, off yeah. for today. All right. Vahid is connecting. Vahid is online. There we go. Hi, Vahid. Hey, how are you? I had a question to Stefan. 
Uh, what are you most excited about T-Node? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I just love the fact that it's, um, I mean, the liquid staking really um, gets me excited. And, and what I like about that is my base capital can stay locked up earning rewards and I can then use that base capital without touching it as a um, you know synthetic token associated with that to confirm I have that and use that in DeFi. And so I can leverage that base capital to still pay my day-to-day -day expenses and grow my wealth with my liquid token. That's really what gets me excited. Um, and, and providing that opportunity to everybody that has coins in all these different projects. Brilliant. Cool. Thanks for the question, Mahid. Uh, I think next up is Yakubu. I think should be our last question. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and also want to appreciate you guys for doing a good thing here. Uh, my question is uh, this. I have a background in finance and uh, I'm thinking of uh, going into uh, research in the DeFi and crypto space. So I'm just wondering if you guys can just uh, point me on uh, where the best I can, uh, how I can best approach this. Uh, maybe if you can point me with to some of the best tools that uh, I can use to do research uh, on the crypto space. Thank you. Good question. Um, um, yeah, I mean, where can you go to do, I mean, it's, there's so much online, right? I mean, we mentioned a number of tools and, and resources where you can learn. Um, yeah. Um, I would, I would suggest, uh, if I, if I may add, uh, yeah. coin market cap, there is coin yeah. gecko. Yeah. I think those resources are probably, uh, kind of the first go to place. Uh, to look at new projects and their price and uh, a bunch of links to those projects, um, as well as uh, if you want to go into more like on-chain analytics, you should check out uh, Dune Analytics or Nansen. Nansen has a pr paid product. Dune Analytics has a free yeah. a tier and then a premium uh, offering as well. Um, there was a bunch of, you can use the uh, blockchain explorers themselves directly. You know, there's Blockchair, there is Etherscan, uh, there is a pretty much a blockchain explorer for every single chain out there. Yeah. So kind of using those tools and being very proficient with them is a super valuable skill and you will have to use those tools sooner or later in your research. Um, what else is there? Uh, I mean, you, you look, I mean, yeah, you've mentioned them all, right? I mean, you've got your trading tools that you need, right? And you've got your sort of treasury management tools and then you've got your on-chain research tools, right? And so Nansen, you know, sort of a great tool to look at on-chain activity. Into the Block is a great source of information. You've get, got more research type tools like Masari and um, um, as another example. And then you've got, you know, your your you can go to, even if you want early stage companies, what are the next companies coming up? You go to like the IDO platforms, right? Launch pads, you look at Polka Starter, you look at Trust Swap, you look at uh, Miso, um, and then you see all these different, you know, and then, yeah, so, so there's so many different sources of information. And, and it, the thing is, once you go in, it's a rabbit hole and, and then you're, 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 you'll stumble across one to the next, but you just got to start somewhere. Yeah. I think this, these, these tools will be a good, great start and then you will find even more uh, things to look into. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. I just, one last question. I just want to find out if you guys will make uh, this, the recording of this, uh, uh, this session available so that uh, I actually joined in late. So maybe I could just go over it. Yes, fantastic. Uh, yeah, we do have a kind of we save these recordings into like a podcast and you can look for it. It's called Work in Crypto. Uh, and we have the links to that, to these recordings on our website and on Twitter as well. So make ah, sure awesome. just to follow us and we'll, uh, we'll tweet it sooner or later. Uh, or just like search for Work in Crypto by Crypto Jobs List on, on your favorite podcasting app. Awesome. Thank you. 
Cool. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I promise you guys. I promise Stefan. One last question from J30. Uh, he looks like a sophisticated degen. So uh, I cannot say no to that. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm adding you, sir. Uh, why, is, uh, why are you not adding? All right. There we go. Uh, there connecting. Go. There we go. J30, there you go. You're All on. Right, so, okay, so my name is um, Femi. I'm from Nigeria. I just wanted to give Yakubu a tip. So when I was starting out, when I wanted to learn more about DeFi, I came across a book by CoinGecko, uh, How to DeFi by, uh, for Beginners. There are two books, one for beginners, one for um, um, an advanced version. So you can try to get that and... Uh, use that to get into learning the basics of DeFi and learning more about DeFi. And the second tip is um, to just try to use DeFi platforms. Try to get on uh, trusted node. Use it, Pancake Swap. Use it, Uniswap. Use it. Uh, the different DeFi platforms that we have. Um, using them and interacting with them is actually the easiest way to understand what is actually going on in um, DeFi. You can check out DeFi Llama, some DeFi dashboards generally. Um, yeah, so that's that. So uh, on to my question now. I want, this question is for Stefan. Uh, hi, Stefan. Hey, nice to meet you, J30. Okay. Um, so uh, my question is, is Trusted Node building for... Um, easier adoption for people that are not quite familiar with using um, DeFi platforms. Okay, so let me let me direct my question this way. So I realized that many people don't know how to interact with DeFi platforms. You literally have to learn them, uh, learn how to use them. I remember by trying to get my first um, um, a coin that hasn't been listed on any centralized exchange, and I had to use um, YouTube tutorial videos to actually um run through the entire process and although i wasn't even understanding what was going on that was some time back already anyways so i just wanted to ask if trusted on this um paying attention to uh the lack of um um let me just say DeFi platforms are not quite intuitive for people that are not familiar with uh DeFi. So it's trusted not trying to build for people to that have not quite adopted this uh, blockchain technology that are just kind of new to it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really, I mean, we're trying to make it really easy for people to want to stake on various blockchains. So you're sitting on specific coins. You already have cryptocurrencies. They may be on a centralized exchange, we want to make it really easy to migrate it from a centralized exchange into um, into yield opportunities, right? But you have to know, in order to interact with Trusted Node, you have to know how to use a decentralized non-custodial wallet. If you don't, you cannot stake because everything we do is non-custodial. You control your keys, you control your coins, and we have built a staking option for you to earn rewards in a non-custodial fashion. Um, yeah, and so you have to know how to use a Kepler wallet. You have to know how to use a MetaMask. You have to know how to use a Terra station, um, etc. And so that is definitely a important factor um, when working with Trusted Node. Okay, thank right. you very much. Thanks so much for the uh, question. All right, I think we're already going to be wrapping up. I think we went over over time significantly. <laughs> uh, sorry, Sherry. I think uh, thanks so much for your question earlier, uh, but we, I think we have to wrap this up. Uh, thanks so much, Stefan, once again uh, for coming on. And uh, for those who missed the beginning, we'll we'll have a recording hopefully. If the uh, if the Jack from Twitter, you know, uh, shows his grace in us and uh, provides the <laughs> recording. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, guys, don't forget the Trusted Node is hiring. They're looking for a social community yes. lead, uh, graphic designers to make usability of DeFi and their product easier as well, and uh, technical writers and technical talent as well. Uh, 